Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. This is my uh, 28 minute slot every Friday and Friday rocks around again. Nice to be here, nice to be back. I've um, had to skip a couple of weeks because I've had family business to attend to. Unfortunately my car blew up and uh, my first cousin, young Terry Fawcett, died and uh, I had to go to his funeral, yet another one. So I'd like to dedicate the show to Terry, uh, my young cousin. I say young, uh, we were born in the same year, me in February and him in October. And he was like a little brother to me. And, you know, being a little brother, I was pretty cruel to him when I was young. And we were very, very competitive, both of us. And we would play a lot of cricket together. And they were our next door neighbours growing up when I was very young and we were always close. We used to spend every Christmas together, their family, the Fawcett's and ours, and we had a, a lot of wonderful times. In fact, Raymond, his older brother, got me into stamp collecting when I was 12 years old, something that I've done ever since, and I've, I've loved it because it's a recording of the history of our country. Now, my show is, is about mental health mental health issues, the struggles that people go through and my experiences and even some suggestions, tips, handy hints, helpful ideas for people. I also complain a fair bit because there's a lot to complain about when it comes to issues of mental health and I must say it was quite upsetting for me to to see Mike Crank King crying on TV handing his medal back, asking for assistance from the government so that he can provide solutions. You know, he's got people ready to go up and running to help especially young people who are going through a terrible, terrible time right now. A lot of fear, not just of the immediate, but fear of the future, what's to happen to them, how their school studies have been so interrupted um, which is undoubtedly going to affect them down the track long after people have forgotten about what we've had to go through so far and undoubtedly what we will have to go through in the future but in 20-30 years from now it'll be long behind us and um, I'm sure that the unfortunate circumstances that these young people have found themselves in will come back to bite them in the butt later on. And um, that is one of the unfortunate pieces of the fallout of a tragedy, is that some people are adversely affected, not just today, but forever. And, um, you know, it's important, very important now more than ever that we give our young people support because they grow up in a world very very different from my own um a world of 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 the information world they live on their phones and so communication technology everything has changed so radically that um kids are emotionally connected through things like Facebook and Messenger and all of this modern technology and it's, it's changed them. There's a lot of stuff that we never had, like cyberbullying, you know, ganging up on people and hating on them and we get we get a lot of this and a lot of it is new to the older people and they're very slow to understand and therefore to react to some of the um, suffering that young people are forced to endure. There, there is some work, some recognition now, but it's been very, very, very slow. And it is important that we do ring fence this thing to some degree, allow some protection for our young people because... Um, this is something that they cannot avoid. They need their their means of social connection. And when that's used to hurt them, um, there's a lot of suffering goes on at a very, very young age, and that can 
change your attitude, the course of your entire life, how that affects you. It, it can drive young people into depression because they feel violated, hurt, they feel like outcasts. And, you know, that can have an, an immense knock-on effect, not just on their lives, but those around them and the relationships that they have in the future are determined by how they are treated. So... It is important to protect these young people because the very nature of being young means that you, you're going to be reckless, you're going to be offensive, you're not necessarily going to think before you leap. And it is only as you mature that you can um, understand the importance of being kind and considerate. Now, some young people are naturally and they grow up in very good homes and I'm talking about the ones where there's not a lot of support where they do struggle and often they don't know what to do there is a lack of information and that's where it needs to be available at that level now to continue on from that theme I, I saw something very disturbing on the TV the other day there was this young netballer her name was Maya and um she was talking about body issues for young women and there were she posted two photos of herself one where she was very i must say very very skinny bony and and one where she was looking a bit fitter and and more healthy and she said she preferred the skinnier version the less healthy version and explained that when she was like that during a COVID lockdown she experienced some pretty considerable health issues being so so hard and you know netball is an extremely aerobic um sport i i don't know if you've ever played it but i've never played anywhere near an elite level like she does but e even you know just kicking around with friends it's so tough it's even harder than rugby you know the the jumping the impact on knees and ankles and back and you've got to be super duper fit you've got to have lungs like hot water bottles you've got to have a good good ticker to keep going it's a very fast paced hard game and um, so it pays if you're light and you've got good elevation and go gadget arms, um, then, you know, that it, it lends itself towards that sort of build. So any girls that are, um, you know, well built will always face criticism about not being an ideal fitness level or shape or whatever, but there are... I'd like to point out always exceptions to the rule and I remember one particular netballer who stands out in my mind in that regard was some um, Wilhelmina Davo and Wilhelmina was a big girl I mean she'd tell you that she was big she was, she was tall too she was easily six foot about six one I think and Wilhelmina was one of the best netballers that New Zealand has ever had the privilege to steal from Melanesia because she was Fijian and I'm pretty sure she represented Fiji at least a couple of times but she played for New Zealand and she was an amazing defender, absolutely amazing. And the thing about her being solid was that she could hold her ground. No one could really push her around. And the other thing about Filomena is she was fast, hand speed like a cobra, absolute lightning speed that she could stop a ball, intercept the ball, pass, and great vision. And I guess that goes to show that regardless of your body shape, it is possible to play at the highest level and be one of the greatest players the game has ever seen, regardless of the fact that you might be a little bit more solid than anybody else because the cream always floats to the top. There is no accounting for ability and skill. And that, at the end of the day, is what we need to be concentrating on. And it pains me to see young women in a position where they are so criticised for not obtaining some kind of Barbie doll image, which is just a nonsense. It's an absolute piece of rubbish, and there's too much emphasis 
on girls' looks. I mean, if, if that young woman was my daughter and she showed me that photo of her in, in the good, healthy state that I consider was the better of the two photos, I would say, hey, girl, that's where you need to be. That's a good, healthy size and shape and to hell with what everyone else is saying. You need to just discard the haters. I mean, it's okay for a guy to be fat and bald as he ages. No one really gives a shite. But for a woman, yeah, see, there's that double standard that's often hidden. It's it's a, a double standard that we shuffle away. Guys are allowed to, to be slobs, but women are expected to wear makeup and have nice hair and wear good clothes and high heels and be thin and all of these impossible images that we throw at young women and they feel worse about themselves and, and suffer considerable mental issues, angst, and it can even drive them on to, to suicidal thoughts because they're not perfect. They suffer bulimia, and, and, you know, that's common amongst young women, throwing food up to try and keep their body weight down and things like that. And, you know, nature doesn't make us all the same, and if it did, how boring it would be, you know, to me, you know, I don't want, I don't want to be hanging out with someone that's totally let themselves go. But, but n nor do I want a Bo Derek. It's not, it's not important. You know, the most important thing is the content of your character, who you are. Are you interesting? Are you fun? Are you a good person? Those things are far, far more important than than the surface. You know, beauty is no more than skin deep physical beauty but real beauty goes all the way to someone's heart and soul and that's what really shines through is the content of people's character and and not these false images that people try to aspire to because they're impossible no one will ever be perfect and even those who are beautiful creatures undoubtedly have a lot of of self-doubt you know even then they pick out minor imperfections and unfortunately it's the nature of human beings to um, to find faults rather than to find beauty and um, I think really we should be seeking the beauty of, of things, of, of people and of nature and not emphasize the ugliness there's plenty of that around plenty to go around without us adding to it and that sort of um undermines people's health and health is not just physical i'm talking mental health and often good mental health leads to good physical health you know if you like yourself you tend to look after yourself and if you don't like yourself or well, well, you tend to do the opposite you tend to let yourself go not look after yourself and, and, and even become negative and destructive and self-harming and we do get a lot of that so when I talk about mental issues mental health issues I, I'm not just talking about things like bipolar which is which is used to be called manic depression, where you bounce up and down from high highs to extreme, you know, terrible lows, or, or obsessive compulsive disorder, abbreviated to OCD, where you. Um, and by the way, if you're wondering if you do have that, there's, there's a few little indicators. One is the numbers, right? One two three four. One two three four. One two three four. One two three four. If you find that you're doing that all the time, one two three four. One two three four. One two three four. That is a sign of obsessive compulsive disorder. Turning all of your cans so that as you stand at the bench, if you look at the pantry, every single one of them is turned ten degrees to the right, so you can see all of the label from where you stand and every single one of them is like that and if one of them is out you need to go and tweak it a couple of degrees again this is it's not attention to detail it's that over the top attention to detail washing your hands 40 50 times a day scrubbing them trying to scrub the dirt out like like lady macbeth with the blood out spot out the um obsessing on things over and over and over and you can't let go 
that's another version of it. A lot of repetition is a, a key sign and not being able to release yourself with it. Being so anxious all of the time, lots of levels of anxiety, um, jangly, twitchy, shaky, um, tense to the point of you find yourself shaking with anxiety or fear or anger, explosive anger is, is another byproduct of that. Extreme thundering depression where you can't even draw the curtains and you don't even want to get out of bed. Having been through those types of things, you've got to remember that the sun can always shine again and it's having hope and working towards something. The hardest step is the first one. The hardest thing is just to lift your head up and take one step forward and often when you're coming out of something you find that um, you get setbacks. You take one step forward and bang, you go three back. And sometimes you're worse than when you started. And that is a hard thing to keep trying, to keep banging away, to keep getting up. But success, the difference between success and failure, failure is refusing to get up and success is getting up one more time than the number you fall. Just get up one more time. And success will come. Persistence is a great attribute to have. But also positivity. That one little candle in the window and all of the darkness around you, that one little piece of hope can free you eventually. Nothing will ever go from zero to a million in a single bound. You will never get to the top of a mountain in a single stride. You know this. Incremental little wins is how you build a good foundation for walking forward. Thinking, acting, instead of reacting and failing to think of anything positive and being stuck in this endless circle of negativity. The day that you stop that and you think of one single thing that you would like to do and go and do it, that is that very first step forward and it may not always be obvious. When it is obvious, when you do something and it can be just taking an interest in birds and walking down the rivers and, and just making notes. If you've got an obsessive compulsive order, make a note. Of all the birds you see, watch the trout in, in the river or go to the sea and go for a nice long walk on the beach on your own or with a good friend and just let the air and the sea and the wind just cleanse you of all of your negative thoughts and you don't even necessarily have to think positive thoughts you just have to let everything go and just let yourself be calm and empty and just look around you and feel everything around you feel the sand under your bare feet I like to walk on the edge of the water and and feel that salt water and feel that sand under my feet and feel the wind on my face and I could taste a little bit of salt in the air and that breathing of the sea. I find that really helps me to get off to sleep. I never have a problem sleeping when I'm near the ocean. But inland, living on the main road with trucks smacking down the road every night and every morning, it's hard. And if you suffer from insomnia as I do, then, you know, days and nights without sleep is, is an utterly exhausting mind if I can tell you. It's very hard to concentrate when you don't get good sleep. And there's, there's two issues here. One is good sleep and two is good food. Those are the keys to help you get to a better place. You are really, really, really going to struggle if either of those is lacking. Sleep and food, decent food, nice food, food that makes you smile, not take away muck 
I'm talking about making something. Even if it's just spaghetti on toast, it's one of my go-tos. has been since I was a kid. I don't know why I love it, I just do. Um, custard and peaches, that's another one. It's not hard, you know, heat, heat up some custard. It's not difficult, tin of peaches. And they're not super expensive things. But just that little bit of comfort food can make you feel physically feel well and it makes you feel good that you've done something for yourself that in itself is empowerment just being able to take a little bit of care of yourself don't always expect others to do it for you and say oh i'm helpless and i'm hopeless there are a few little things that you can do for yourself you know people have experienced lockdown during covid well my life is locked down i've spent over a decade pretty much locked in a room, only ever seeing people to buy something. I don't spend a lot of time with a lot of people because I don't like people. I don't like the way they treat me. I don't like the way they treat each other. They disappoint me. They let me down. I guess you could say I'm a a difficult and awkward person to um, to be with, to communicate with. And, And sometimes, yeah, I am really difficult I get very frustrated and annoyed by uh, people's disrespect and disregard for each other and it really cranks me really winds me and sometimes I find myself bitterly complaining about things like this it's hard and sometimes it's better to let it out than to bottle it up because bottling things up just leads to more frustration and frustration to anger and, 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 and so it can burst out of you in ways that you don't control too well and that is a dangerous and bad situation to be in so it's better you let it out even if you talk to yourself I mean that may be the only intelligent conversation you get in an entire day so be it better out than in I say well it's almost time up We've got a little bit more time. A few of the other issues that I would like to talk about are the current state of affairs where um, people are under enormous financial pressure, job uncertainty, having to face careers. I think what we need right now is voice of reason, the calmness, and, you know... Despite everyone talking about global warming, I mastered an experience the coldest night it's had in 27 years last week. So, um, you know, it's it's pretty tough at the bottom for those who are suffering at the moment who don't have a lot of money. You know, we, we talk about these healthy homes and I talk to people who work in, in these types of industries and... Um, I was talking to a chap who does heat pumps the other day and he was saying, well, you know, unfortunately the the rules, the regs don't necessarily suit what's right and the rules often get in the way so that heat pumps are put in the incorrect positions simply because that's what the rules state. And then on top of that, people are so damn poor with such exorbitant rents that they don't use them anyway. They they feel that it's too expensive and they can't afford the electricity, so they go without. So their houses are damp and cold despite the fact that they may very well have a heat pump and there may be insulation in the walls and ceilings. Now, believe you me, I appreciate that. There's great strides forward that we are making those shitty council houses a little bit better for the people forced to live in them. But unfortunately, when you don't have enough coinage for power um, and you're struggling even to put food on the table, I would like everybody to remember those folks that are struggling and to help out outfits like here in Marston and the Marston Food Bank. They could really do with some help. There are only 125 um, families or so that are in dire need and yes there are institutions helping out but I'd like to think that the community could do a bit more for its own community and its own people these are not people taking the mickey (coughs) I did ask them down at the food bank about that and they said look it's hardly anyone just comes along for a free feed excuse me (coughs) 
these people are in fact in genuine need and they're for real for real you know and they don't have a lot in fact they don't have enough and it's nice to think that nobody should go hungry nobody should suffer especially not kids kids growing up in an environment like that the whole world is telling them that they don't care that that these kids are trash you know because they're not being looked after and every kid Every single kid deserves to be looked after by the community and grow up in a society where they feel that they're a part of it, that they're, they're engaged, that they're not pushed to the outside because of, of, of race or religion or financial circumstances. We know that's not right. That's not the society that we live in. This is one of the coolest places to live because pretty much everybody gets on with each other. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of misunderstanding about the Islamic world, about Muslims. Um, they are still treated with an enormous degree of suspicion, prejudice and, and misunderstanding. And even with the, the, the mosque massacres that happened, I still find that Muslims in this country are very much treated like foreigners. Whereas, of course, they're not. They're, they're citizens just like anybody else, and they deserve the same amount of respect and less suspicion. Um, as it turns out, they're really lovely people, and they have a, a, a beautiful uh, religion, a, a, a very caring and, and loving society. And by the way, they live by the Ten Commandments, just like everybody else. You know, they're not so very different at all. Just because they speak a different language or, or have a different religion doesn't make them different. They are exactly the same as us. They want everything that we do. And in fact, they are us and they are we. They are our community and our people. Equal in every way. So... I would like to see us show a little bit more kindness, consideration, caring and understanding to people who are often ostracised in our society because they're a little bit different. What you've got to realise is that they are so much the same and we need to show them more than just lip service. We need to show them that we care. Show them. Do it every day, not just let this whole thing go away and then we can forget and go back to the way we were. I'm hoping that these terrible incidents like acts of terrorism against the Muslim community, that this whole horrible COVID thing, I hope we learn lessons from this that there's only us to look after us and the more we care for each other, the better this country can be and we can show the whole world how people should treat each other, regardless of race, creed and colour. We live in an enormously multicultural society here, although, of course, we must always recognise and respect the indigenous people of this country, and that has been lacking for so very long. It is slowly starting to happen, the recognition of Māori and their importance in our society, our definition of, of who we are and what we are and what we're about very much hinges on our recognition of the special and significant place that Māori hold in this country, being Indigenous and part of this land, uh, the lungs, the mind, the heart, the soul of this place. So it's nice to see some degree of recognition and, and even elevation now. So that is encouraging at least. My time's up for another day. I better make it quick. Thank you very much to all the sponsors, to Michael and Veronica, to Wairapa TV. You do wonderful work and you empower me, so thank you very much for that. Also to our good listeners up on the carpet in, in the beautiful Hawke's Bay and, and here in the wonderful Wairapa. It's, it's a wonderful place to live. You know, driving through that countryside is, is probably my most favourite experience and getting to know people in this country and getting to know this country more is a very special experience and I'm very, very grateful for it. So I hope you enjoyed today. 
bit of food for thought and um, I'll try and make it next week. I'll, I'll do my utmost and I hope you enjoy it. Share it with your friends. Tune in, don't drop out. Thanks and I will catch you next week. Bye for now.